well topic. I want to get to a little bit of, of the geometry and topology of coxeter groups, and particularly with the way that the geometric group theorists think about them. And so mostly today I want to um, just take some baby steps beyond spherical and Euclidean. And in particular, most of the day I want to talk about, about hyperbolic geometry. And then tomorrow we'll talk about more general types of geometry beyond that. The, there's first one thing that I want to do that's left over from, from last time, from yesterday. And that is, there's, there's two things that I want to do. I want to talk about um, the natural pairing of vectors and dual vectors. And I want to talk about constructing a dual basis. Because as you saw, the, the stuff that we did yesterday with, with switching the, the standard representation to the dual representation involved taking matrices and replacing them with their inverse transpose. <clears throat> and I said the transpose, at the end when I was explaining why this was working, I was saying that, that, that taking the transpose of a matrix corresponds to replacing a basis with its dual basis. And I was giving you a little bit of a feel for, for how I like to think about vectors and dual vectors all within the same original vector space. And I wanted to, um, to talk about, about these two topics just to complete what we're doing. So if you remember from, from yesterday, so vectors are equivalence classes of pairs of points. Dual vectors are equivalence classes of parallel hyperplanes. Right? And if you think of them so, so what do I mean by this natural pairing of a vector and a dual vector? Um, if you give me a vector and you give me a dual vector, when you combine them, there's a number. The way this was usually presented to you is you think of a vector and you think of a dual vector as a functional. And so then the pairing is you just apply the functional to the vector and you see what the answer is. Right? So with the way that I'm thinking about this, you've got a dual vector and you've got a vector, you translate the vector so that it starts at the origin and it ends here. You translate the dual vector so that it goes through the origin and then goes to here. And then you just say some scalar multiple of the dual vector contains the tip of the vector. Right? Here's the dual vector, here's the vector. If I scalar multiply this appropriately, it'll go through the point. And so you just answer what scalar multiple goes through the point. Okay? Because as I look at the scalar multiples, you know, here's a dual vector, here's twice the dual vector, here's half the dual vector. The, it goes in the opposite direction. Um, half the dual vector, or twice the dual vector, half the dual vector. And so there's some scalar so that it goes through the tip of the vector. And that's the answer. And it's the same answer you would get if you constructed a functional so that this was the kernel, this went to 1, and then you see where this goes, it's the same answer. Okay? But it's just sort of a visual way of doing it. So the dual basis, if you have a basis e1 dot 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 up to en, or v1 up to vn, if you have a collection of vectors that are linearly independent, what you're supposed to be creating, let's make them v so that they're, so that they're not confused with the standard basis vectors. If you have a collection of linearly independent vectors, you're supposed to create dual vectors so that the natural pairing of vi and vj, what do you want the pairing to be? You want it to either be 0 or 1. You want it to be 0 if i is not equal to j, and you want it to be 1 if i is equal to j. And I just want to to comment that you can construct a dual basis from a basis in this geometric fashion very easily because if I give you say five linearly independent vectors and now I want to try and create a dual basis well according to the way I want them to pair up I want if I want to create the 
if, I, if, I, if this is V1 and I want to create V1 star, what should it be? Well, this should lie in the hyperplane, this should lie in the hyperplane, this should lie in the hyperplane, and this should lie in the hyperplane, in the kernel. Well, they span a hyperplane. And then I want this to go to 1, and so that should be the parallel hyperplane. So I take all but one of the vectors and I turn it into a hyperplane, and then I take the parallel copy that goes through the tip of the remaining vector. And that's my dual vector. And so if I've got, let's do it just with 3, if I've got 3, if I take this plane and this plane, that's dual to this vector in this basis. If I take this plane and this plane as my, hyper, as my dual vector, that's dual to this vector. And if I take this plane and that plane, that's dual to this vector. Okay? And so you really can't just construct the dual basis from the original basis immediately. And um, that one of the reasons why I wanted to mention that is that when we took our standard representation with our vectors being E1, E2, E3, and we wrote down our, um, applied the Carton involution and got the new matrix, one thing that happened was that we ended up getting hyperplanes that were now coordinate hyperplanes. And that's because we were constructing a dual basis in a sense. And so our new hyperplane was the XZ plane, the YZ plane, and the XY plane. We all, I think we only got to the two-dimensional example, but we got the X-axis and the Y-axis. And in higher dimensions, you really get, would get the coordinate planes because that's how dual bases work. Okay. So that's just a few more final comments on the stuff from yesterday. Now I want to go beyond spherical and Euclidean. Um, And so the first thing that I want to talk about is I want to talk about something that I've kind of been using implicitly, but let me go ahead and, and um, say it explicitly, and that's something called Sylvester's theorem. And um, let me say it in two parts. Every real symmetric matrix has real eigenvalues that's sort of the easy part and then the more complicated part is that the number of positive, negative and zero eigenvalues is invariant under change of basis. Okay, so if you have a real symmetric matrix, then it has real eigenvalues, and once you know that all the eigenvalues are real, um, then you can classify them as positive, negative, and zero. Um, I want to think of this real symmetric matrix the way that we've been using real symmetric matrices. I want to think of a real symmetric matrix as a way of building a bilinear form, a product on V that gives me real answers, right? That gives me something that looks like a dot product. And, and then you can, um, you can look at a form like this in a particular basis. You can give V a basis and then you can write down what this looks like and you can um, um, then you could try looking at the exact same form but rel with respect to a different basis of V. You'll get a different matrix. The new matrix will be related to the old matrix in a very simple way and basically what I want to say with Sylvester's theorem is that as you start looking at this form under different bases the number of positive eigenvalues, zero eigenvalues, and negative eigenvalues never changes. That, that, the, that the, the number of positive, negative, and zero eigenvalues for one particular matrix, it's not just a property of the matrix, it's a property of this dot product. It's a property of the form. Okay? It's not a property of the form with a particular basis. It's inherent in the form. Um, in particular, um, 
there's a um, stronger way to say this, um, which is that, um, in fact, if you give me a symmetric bilinear form, <coughs> For every symmetric bilinear form, there exists a basis so that in this basis, the form looks like Remember, this means the coordinates of u with respect to this particular basis, the coordinates of v with respect to this particular basis. Um, something like this, where m is quite simple. It looks like a bunch of positives, positive ones, a bunch of negative ones, and a bunch of zeros. It's sort of block diagonal that it has p positive, so p1s, q minus 1s, and r0s. OK. Um, if we had a little bit more time, I would actually go ahead and prove this for you. It's actually, the proof is not very hard, um, but it requires a little bit of work. And so I'm not going to do it um, with the time remaining. Um, but it is sort of an interesting thing. The basic idea is that if you, you essentially can start almost anywhere. You start with some vector and you say, all right, let's suppose that it had a, that its length was positive, that u dot u was positive. If u dot u is positive length, I can find a scalar multiple of u that has length 1. Because, because my form is bilinear, if the inner product of u with itself is, um, well, k, what's the inner product of au with au? Because it's linear, the scalars pull out. And so this is going to be a squared k. And then um, that's going to be some positive real. But by choosing this appropriate, I can put any positive real there I want. And so if this is a 17, I can make this 1 over 17. And so I can turn this into a 1. Because I get an a squared, I can't turn this into a minus 1. Right? But I can change it up to, I can change it up to multiplication by an arbitrary positive real just by rescaling u. OK. So essentially, the proof goes like this. You, you pick a vector. Um, you rescale it so that it has length 1, 0, or minus 1. Um, let's assume that it's 1 or minus 1. In that case, then you say, well, let's look at everything perpendicular to it. Everything perpendicular to it is going to be some codimension 1 thing. And because this is length 1, it's going to be some distinct codimension 1 thing, because this is not perpendicular to itself. And then you just go there, and you start looking for vectors there. And as long as you keep, as long, and yeah. So you start doing it by induction, and the thing that causes the proof to be slightly complicated is you, that zeros act strangely. Because if I take a zero and I look at things perpendicular, a vector of length zero, which does exist sometimes, vectors of length zero, when I look at the perpendiculars, when I look at the things orthogonal, it includes that vector. And so then you have to do something. But um, essentially, you can find a basis where you end up getting this nice form. It's all on the diagonals. They're all ones, minus ones, and zeros. And then you look at your matrix relative to that. It's sort of like um, if, and so if you had a positive definite matrix, then this would end up saying that you can end up finding a place. You can find a basis where it looks like standard dot product. You could find a, a, a basis where all of the one, all, where the diagonal looks like ones. And when you think about that here, that's standard dot product in this basis. OK? All right. The main things that I want to say about this, so the, the number, so because it's an invariant, 
positives, negatives, and zeros. Um, actually, well, I could call it P, N, and Z. That's probably a better notation. These numbers are called the signature of M. And so just to say the same things that I said in, a, in this new terminology, what this is saying is that every real symmetric matrix has a signature, number of positive, negative, and zero eigenvalues. But the signature is not just a property of the matrix, but actually all the other matrices you can get by taking the same form and viewing it in a different basis. Okay, That looking at the same symmetric bilinear form in a different basis, you'll get other matrices that also have the exact same signature. Okay? Okay. Um, all right. Now, um, the next thing that I want to comment is that um, A coxeter group W is spherical if and only if the signature of its coxeter matrix is, in this case, N0,0. Zero, zero. Positive definite. And it's Euclidean if and only if the signature of its Coxeter matrix. is n minus 1, 1, put the zeros at the wrong, in a different spot, right? Um, positive semi-definite with only one zero. So when I say that what we're going to be doing now is we're going to be going beyond spherical and Euclidean, what I really mean is we're going to start talking about Coxeter groups defined by diagrams whose Coxeter matrices have signatures other than these two. Okay? We're going to start looking at more general signatures. Rather than having all of them pos all of the eigenvalues positives or all but one of the eigenvalues positive with the final one being zero, we're going to look at ones that have some number of positives, some number of negatives, some number of zeros. Just completely arbitrary. Okay? The, um, and um, when we do this, so look, I want to go ahead and start working on getting you to understand the geometry of the different signatures. Um, and so, yeah, let me say it this way. So, when you start with a Coxeter diagram, it gives you the Coxeter matrix. You just put ones down the diagonal, cosine pi minus pi over m off the diagonal. That comes directly from the graph. We build this new matrix. This matrix has eigenvalues. We know that this matrix can be used to create a symmetric bilinear form, and that symmetric bilinear form can be used to create reflections, and those reflections will have the right properties, they'll have the right orders, the right relations, and they'll actually generate a copy of our Coxeter group. Right? But we're doing it with a symmetric bilinear form defined by a matrix that has lots of non-zero entries, which makes it slightly hard to sort of see what's going on. <laughs> 
And so because the matrix M, the Coxeter matrix, has so many non-zero entries, typically, what we want to do is we want to change the basis so that the matrix looks nicer. Because then the geometry is clear. When we do that, it's gonna, it has a cost. If we try to make the matrix nice, then rather than using the standard basis vectors, we're going to be using strange vectors, but with better geometry. Okay? So, um, what I want to do is I want to try and look at standard matrices, these kind of matrices, and give you a feel for the geometry. And then we'll start taking Coxeter groups and start switching them over to this picture. Okay? And so we're not going to talk about Coxeter groups for a while. We're just going to talk about um, symmetric bilinear forms with matrices of this form. Okay. So, first goal. Understand the geometry of vector spaces with symmetric bilinear forms defined by simple matrices Um, is this notation okay? Is everybody okay with this? In this, if I wrote that, what would that be in this form? I3 minus I2 and then 0, 2. Right? This just represents a zero, a block, a matrix of zeros. This represents the, minus the identity matrix of size Q and the identity matrix of size P. Yeah? And then everything else is zero. Everything else is zero. OK. And recall what the symmetric bilinear form is doing. Normally, when you have a vector space, you know what it means for two vectors to be scalar multiples of each other. You know about linear dependence. Um, you can know about span. Uh, but generally, if all you're given is a vector space, it doesn't make any sense to talk about the angle between two vectors. It doesn't, if you have a vector in this direction and a vector in this direction, it doesn't make sense to ask which one is longer in a general vector space because you have no way of measuring. In an arbitrary vector space, if all you're given is a vector space, you can talk about, in, if, if the vectors are linearly dependent, you can talk about this one being five times the other one. You can talk about one being a scalar multiple of the other one. If they're in different directions, you can't compare. There's no sense in which this one is bigger or smaller than this one. Right? And that's exactly what the symmetric bilinear form is doing. It's acting like dot product. And so you can take u dot u, and that gives you a, a, a notion of squared length. Right? And um, sometimes that answer is going to come out negative now. Because now we no longer have positive definite forms. And so sometimes the answer is positive, sometimes it's zero, sometimes it's negative. And so we're not going to take square roots anymore. Let's just talk about the norm of a vector. So the norm of a vector vector v it's just the, the inner product V with itself. It might be positive, it might be negative. Um, and so this corresponds to squared length. In the, if this was ordinary dot product, this would be the square of the length. But we're just going to focus on this. And now it'll sometimes have a positive norm, a negative norm, or, or a zero norm. OK. So in trying to move beyond Positive, definite, positive, semi-definite. Let's take the simplest example that has a negative eigenvalue. Let's let M 
be 1, 0, 0, minus 1. OK? So, so this is signature 1, 1, 0. 1 positive eigenvalue, 1 negative eigenvalue, no 0 eigenvalues. Right? OK. So um, let's try some calculations. Um, well, let's just jump straight in. Um, I want to find out the, the norm of the vector xy. Right? I want to find out the norm of the vector xy. Um, so how do I do that? I'm looking at the inner product of xy with itself. And by definition, what is that? It's the transpose times the matrix times the column vector. And you can work that out. When you multiply this times that, you get x negative y. When you do this, you get x squared minus y squared. Right? OK. And as you can see, then you can get positive answer, negative answer, zero answer. Right? And so if I said, um, what's the norm of E1? This is norm 1. Right? This is a unit vector. If I looked at E2, its norm is minus 1. And so now you can see why we don't want to talk about length. If we were going to talk about length, this would be length i or something. Right? Because it's the square root of minus 1. So we're not going to square root anymore. This is norm minus 1, norm 1. OK? Um, and uh, what about the point 1, 1? What about that vector? Zero. zero. Right? And so this is a non-trivial vector that has zero norm. Non-trivial vector that has zero norm. Um, in fact, um, now that we have the general formula, can you tell me all vectors that have zero norm? So if this is equal to zero, what does that tell you? Right? And then we get either x equals y or x equals minus y. All of these have norm zero. Now, one good reason for um, one good reason for for finding out the norms of the various vectors is that if you so remember we're we're doing this in preparation for looking at representations of Coxeter groups into these things. When we when we represented Coxeter groups as linear transformations, we did it by generating them with reflections, r sub alpha. And r sub alpha was defined using the quadratic form. Right? It fixed a bunch of stuff, and it sent something to its negative. And one thing that you can show is that the r sub alphas that we defined before, r sub alpha of x, one thing that you can show is that the r sub alpha of x's defined earlier preserve the bilinear form. And what I mean by preserve the bilinear form is that the bilinear form of two vectors, u and v, is equal to the bilinear form of r alpha u, r alpha v. That the angle between them before you apply the reflection and the angle between them after you apply the reflection are equal. Okay. In particular, if I let u equal v, this says that it takes a vector of a particular norm and it sends it to a vector with the same norm. So that norm is preserved. And so if I have a and so when I look at a Coxeter group, if I was looking at a Coxeter group represented in something of this signature, um, this vector of norm one 
never goes to this vector. In fact, it can only go to the other vectors of norm 1. And so it's good to actually know, and similarly with the norm 0 vectors, the vector, the orange, has to actually be sent to the orange. And so it's good to know what things there are of norm 1, what things there are of norm minus 1. Um, so yeah, so let's change this. What if I said, um, what things have norm 1? What's that? That's a hyperbola, right? It's a hyperbola. And actually, what are these? Those are the axes of the hyperbola, right? And we also know that, that this is something of norm 1. And so you could think of it from the equation, but it's going to come through like this. And so these are the vectors of norm 1. And now if you actually think about it, um, it should be clear also what are the vectors of norm minus 1. If I put a minus 1 there instead, I can change the signs. It's going to be a hyperbola in the other direction. I hear everybody clicking their colored pens. This is, you need that for this class, right? Um, what about uh, norm 5? It's just going to be a rescaled version of this, right? And so it's just going to be parallel. And so as you start looking at norm 1, norm 2, norm 3, norm 4, norm 5, you're just going to get hyperbolas out here. And norm minus 2, minus 3, et cetera, just look like that. In fact, all the things with positive norm are rescaled versions of this hyperbola. All the things with negative norm are rescaled versions of this hyperbola. And then this is the stuff of norm 0. Um, I should mention that a lot of times when you talk about a vector space with a symmetric bilinear form, so that you have positive norms, negative norms, and zero norms, that this is actually something that shows up in um, Einstein's theory of relativity. And so there's, there's language coming from physics that gets used for these. Positive norm um, vectors with positive, negative, Zero norm are called, and so you're supposed to read this. When you read the top line, you're supposed to read the top line, right? Um, are called space like um, time like and light like. Um, not just for this example, but usually you change it so that you have three positive ones and one negative one, and then you end up thinking of it as you've got three-dimensional space going through time, and you've got a point, and you've got a point, and if the going from here to there, you take that vector, you apply the inner product, if you end up getting a positive answer, then it basically means that you've got a point in space-time and a point in space-time, and there is no way to get from here to there, even if you travel at the speed of light. And so there's a space-like relationship between the two. If the vector has norm zero, then you could get from this point in space and time to that point in space and time, but you would have to travel at the speed of light to get from one to the other. And then if it's like with a negative norm, then you can actually travel there through time at some speed lower than the speed of light. Okay, So sometimes you use this language, space-like, time-like, and light-like, instead of these. In particular, the um, set of vectors of norm 0, the, the is called the light cone. called the light cone. 
And because, um, for two reasons. First off, it's, it's the vectors that are light-like. It's the vectors that are light-like. Why is it called a cone? Well, if you think about it, if this has norm zero, what if I double it? Still norm zero, right? If I take a times a vector, it's still going to have norm zero. Because if u dot u was equal to zero, a u dot a u is going to be a squared times zero, and it's still zero. And so light-like vectors are closed under scalar multiples, and so it looks like something coned off towards the origin. And so it really does look like a cone. Okay? All right. Let's try to make this a little more interesting. Um, oh, right. So um, the reflections that we defined before preserve the bilinear form. Uh, this is just a quick check. You just plug in the formulas and you actually just check that you always get the same answer. Um, but once you know that, once you know that the generators preserve the bilinear form, then it's very easy to see that products of the generators, compositions of the generators, preserve the bilinear form, which means that every element of the Coxeter group preserves the bilinear form. And if I take two vectors and I calculate their angle using the form, and then I take those two vectors and I apply some element of W, I'll get some two new vectors and I calculate their angle, same answer. Right? Once I know it's true for the generators, I know it's true for the whole group. Um, in particular, um, actually before we leave this example, let's actually, um, well, I'll leave it on the board. I'll come back and make some comments about it in a second. Let's go to a, a slightly more complicated example. So example two. I'm not going to write the entries off the diagonal. So we've got plus 1, plus 1, minus 1. So now let's calculate the norm of a vector. And it's going to be x, y, z. And what do we get? x squared plus y squared minus z squared. Um, by the way, um, hopefully when we're doing this calculation, you can see how nice it is to have lots of zeros and ones and minus ones on the diagonal. You get very simple answers, which makes it very easy to analyze. If I put one, two, three, you know, if I put random numbers here, what would we have? We'd have an x squared term and a y squared term, an xy term, a xz term, a yz term. And trying to understand what that is as, a, as, a, as, a, uh, as a, a, a conic in space is complicated. But with a change of basis, it turns from, say, an ellipsoid or an elliptic hyperboloid down into some standard hyperboloid or some standard shape that's going to be easier to analyze. So what's this picture look like? Um, yeah, I'll just use this space here at the bottom. So what do we have? We've got x, y, and z. Um, maybe we could start with the light cone. When is this zero? When is this zero? When x squared plus y squared is the same as z squared. And what is x squared plus y squared? Well, that's just the squared distance in the xy plane which you might call r squared, if you think about the plane and polar coordinates. And so what's it going to look like? We have r squared equals z squared. And so if you think about it in the rz plane, what does it look like? Looks like this, right? r equals z, r equals minus z. Right? So what does that look like here under the rotation? Looks like the usual sort of double cone, right? Okay. Yeah, this is just, yeah, the equation, um, yeah, so we have 
z equals plus or minus the square root of x squared plus y squared is one way to think of it. That z is plus or minus the radius in the xy plane. It's a nice circular cone. Okay. Um, what about the unit vectors? When I look at, at just the unit vector in the x direction, that's going to have length 1, right? norm 1. Unit vector in the y direction, length 1. Um, actually, if I just look at the xy plane, if I forget about z for a second, then my norm is just telling me the squared distance from the origin. And so what are my, what are my curves looking like? The, the, the sphere of radius, oh, by the way, you can actually, um, if you think about what a sphere is, a sphere is just the set of points norm 1, right? Sphere, the unit sphere in, in the standard dot product is just the set of points of norm 1. And so you could actually talk about this being the sphere of norm 1 in this inner product. For this inner product, this is the sphere of, radius of norm 1. This is the sphere of norm minus 1. This is the sphere of norm 0. Okay? That the shapes change because we're using a different inner product, but we can still talk about them being as spheres relative to this inner product. So, here's the light cone. Um, what, and so if we were looking in the xy plane, the sphere of radius 1 is actually going to look like a circle. The sphere of radius 2 is going to look like a bigger circle. Uh, because of the way this is written, it's got a nice rotational symmetry to it. Um, what would you guess? in all of R3, the sphere of radius 1 is going to look like. Yeah, it's going to be a hyperboloid of one sheet. Right? And so it's going to be sort of like that. Yeah? That's the sphere of radius 1. Um, how are you going to get negatives out of this? Well, one way to get a negative is to have 0, 0, 1 that if you look at the z-axis, the unit vector there is going to have norm minus 1. And what's going to happen for the sphere of radius of norm minus 1? It's going to be the hyperboloid of two sheets, right? With this as the, as the limiting. Something like that, right? Okay. All right. So, um, there's a couple examples. I'm going to do one more example. Let's come over here. Okay. So, we're starting along our goal. We're trying to understand the geometry of vector spaces with a symmetric bilinear form defined by very simple matrices and getting a feel for what they look like. Um, you might think uh, for a second about, what if I have uh, two positives and two negatives? If I have two positives and two negatives, then that gets kind of interesting. That's sort of tricky to, diff to visualize. If I have something of signature 2, 2. Um, uh, well, first off, it's tricky because we're now talking about R4, which makes it hard to picture. Um, how do we get from this picture so this picture, well, by replacing the single one with the second with, with two ones, basically we just add an extra direction and we give it rotational symmetry. And so if we add an extra minus one, we'd add an extra direction and we'd spin it that way. And what happens um, um, right now, one thing that you can do is that um, uh, one thing that you can do to give yourself an extra dimension to, to be able to visualize is that if a vector has, has positive norm, its scalar multiples have positive norm. So rather than looking at all of them, how about we just intersect it with the, with the ordinary unit sphere? Okay, that tells me all the directions coming out of the origin. And for each direction coming out of the origin, I can assign it a color of either blue, red, or orange. Right? So if I intersect this with a sphere, ordinary sphere. If I intersect this, which is the ordinary ball, 
What does the light cone look like? Well, the light cone sort of looks like that. Right? What does this end up looking like? Well, that ends up being that. What does this and this end up looking like? Well, projectively, if I just, it looks like that. Sort of the top and bottom caps. Right? Um, if, if I tried to do, nope, keep taking all my erasers. OK. If I tried to do, If I try to do this and um, yeah, I think there's some pretty pictures that I want to show you, but I think I might not have time. Let me just go ahead and and um, say it uh, visually. Um, um, This orange shape that you see here, um, what does it look like? It looks like two circles, right? Um, and in fact, what it really is, is it's a zero sphere times a one, one sphere. The sphere, the zero sphere, that's, this, that's the unit vectors in the real line, which is just two points, right? This is the, circ this is the unit vectors in R2. That's a circle. And so I get two points. Direct product to circle gives me two circles. What happens over here is I end up getting, yeah, actually, let's draw this. What happens when I draw the same picture here? Now I just only look at the things I intersect with a circle, and the light cone ends up looking like this just four points. The blue ends up looking like this. And the red ends up looking like this. Right? Um, what's the light cone look like? The light cone looks like S0 cross S0. Um, let me just claim some things without proof. But it, with the formulas, you can actually prove them pretty straight, in a pretty straightforward fashion. If you have M, in this case, the light cone is S1 cross S1 when you intersect with the three sphere. If you intersect it with the three sphere, what, what is S1 cross S1? Circle cross circle? It's a torus. And so what happens is that you're inside S3. There's an orange torus where the inside is blue. And the outside is red. And um, one way to think about this is that, um, that with your positive directions and negative directions, they define a positive definite red subspace and a positive definite blue subspace. Right? You've got a positive definite red subspace, positive definite blue subspace. So in this case, just the x-axis and the y-axis. In this case, the xy plane and the z-axis. Right? And then the, your norm in the positive definite space is coming from those coordinates. And your norm in the other one is coming from the other coordinates. And whether you're positive or negative depends on the balance. And so what you get is that in your high dimensional space, you have a red subspace where it's positive definite standard dot product. You have a blue subspace, um, or you have a blue subspace, positive definite standard dot product. You have a red subspace, negative definite, negative of the standard dot product. And what you want is you want to look at the light cone as the place where they're balanced. And so you look at vectors in this, in the, in the red direction whose norm is the you know, regular dot product is the same as those in the blue direction. 
And so you go out in the red direction, say norm a half. Go out in the blue direction, norm a half. Anything with red norm, actually minus a half, and blue norm plus a half is going to have total norm zero. Yeah. And so what you do is you get um, a scaled model of the unit circle in the blue direction plus anything in the scaled model of the unit sphere in the red direction. I think I just switched red and blue. But you take any of these and any of these and combine, they'll give you norm zero. And so it'll always end up being a sphere across a sphere for the light cone. Norm a half, norm negative a half in the blue subspace and the red subspace. And so it'll always be a product of two spheres. If you pick something of smaller norm in the red and bigger norm in the blue, then you'll end up having total norm positive. If you end up having bigger norm in the red, smaller norm in the blue, your total norm is negative. And so you're always going to be taking your big sphere, chopping it with a, with a direct product of two spheres, and having the inside and the outside being red and blue. Okay. Um, all right, sort of like this. Um, but it gets more interesting when you get to higher dimensions because once you get both P and Q above two, then you get things like tori and products of spheres and nice connected strange things. Okay. Um, the last example that I want to do is one down. in lower dimensions. Let's try something like this, 1, 1, 0. This is actually one that we implicitly did before, but I want to now, now that we've drawn a couple of pictures, let's go back and look at this one and see what it looks like. So if, if the matrix is 1, 1, 0, let's just do the calculation. The norm of x, y, z, is x, y, z, 1, 1, 0, x, y, z. And what is it? X squared plus y squared. Right? Z just drops out completely in this case. And so if we are going to try and draw the picture here, um, what's the light cone look like? You can certainly get things of norm zero on the z-axis. This is positive definite on the xy plane. Um, the z-axis is actually the only way you can get this to be zero. Right? Um, what about things off the z-axis? Anything that's not on the z-axis has a positive norm. So everything else is blue. Right? Everything else is blue. Um, what's the sphere of norm one? It's going to be a cylinder around, right? It's a cylinder around the z-axis. It's the unit circle in the xy plane with an arbitrary z, because z doesn't affect the norm, right? All right. Um, and this picture should look like the picture that we were talking about last time when we were talking about the 333 A2 tilde Coxeter group. That we ended up saying that there was, there was a vector that was in all the hyperplanes that was fixed. In the norm, it's norm zero. And then I said that the spheres, that the cylinders the, of, of particular radius around that are fixed set wise, that you can move them around, but the points that are, that are a particular distance away from the axis are sent to points a, di a particular distance away from the axis. That's because the Coxeter groups preserve the bilinear form and the sphere of radius one is a cylinder. And so those points get sent to themselves. The bigger cylinders get sent to themselves. Um, and actually, um, let me do one more thing. If, let's. Try and calculate angles between vectors. 
If I try to calculate the angle between these two vectors, these two vectors, so I take two random vectors and I try to calculate their angle here. So I have x1, y1, z1, x1, y1, z1. And I plug those into this. What am I going to get? I'm going to get the dot product of their projections in the xy plane. That, in fact, the z component of each of them is completely irrelevant. Right? Because of the zero there. There's an entire row of zeros, an entire column of zeros, and so the z component's irrelevant, and it's really just measuring angle this way. Right? Okay. All right. Um, oh, actually, there was one last thing that I wanted to mention to tie this up to previous things. Um, do you remember when you were... Um, there was an exercise that I gave you where I said, find a simple root system for the finite coxeter, for the finite coxeter groups and then find a linear dependency. Um, uh, and you could do the same thing, or this was for the Euclidean coxeter groups. Take a Euclidean coxeter group diagram, find roots, find the linear dependency. And you had integers that you labeled, adding them all up. Those integers that add up, um, those exact numbers, and so like if, um, in the case of the E8, we had uh, 6, um, 3, 4, 2, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. These numbers, if you throw them together into a vector, that's the vector that's in all the hyperplanes. That if you actually, yeah. If you look at the standard represent, representation, how do I want to say this? Um, if you go through the entire process that we've been going through for, for the E8 tilde Coxeter group, because the matrix corresponding to this has determinant zero, the picture will end up looking like this. It'll have a seven-dimensional positive definite direction. It'll have one direction that has norm zero. In the standard basis, where this is the vector you use to write down um, RE1, RE2, RE3, this is E1, E2, E3. You look at standard basis vectors, and you use the Coxeter matrix to, to write down a symmetric bilinear form, and you look at the reflection that moves this one, the reflection that moves this one, the reflection that moves this one. This has some hyperplane, this has some hyperplane, this has some hyperplane. There's eight different hyperplanes, nine actually. Nine different hyperplanes that, oh, and because of the linear dependency among the roots, there's a linear dependency among the hyperplanes. Um, <clears throat> because of the linear dependency of the columns of the, of, the, of the Coxeter matrix, there's a linear dependency among the hyperplanes, which means that there's some vector that is orthogonal to all of the basis vectors. Okay? And in that standard basis vectors, with the standard representation, the coordinates of that vector will be these coordinates. Okay, because this is the linear combination of standard basis vectors that's linear dependent. This will actually be, um, there'll be a vector that depending on what order you put the vertices will be, have coordinates 2, 4, 6, 3, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And that um, if you think back to the linear dependency for A2 tilde, a2 tilde was this Coxeter diagram, and it had roots like 1 slash 2, 2 slash 3, 3 slash 1, and the linear dependency was one of those, one of those, one of those, which is why the, the vector 1, 1, 1 was in all the hyperplanes. That's what I'm saying. That here we had 1, 1, 1, that the sum of the three roots was 0, with coefficients 1, 1, 1. That's why this was in all the hyperplanes. And that over here, because of this linear dependency, that's the vector that's in all the hyperplanes. Okay. Um, all right. Um, okay. So, I've got 15 minutes. Um, I think the thing that I want to do is... I want to focus in on this particular example. Well, let me leave this up first. Um, 
Uh, one comment that I should make before I completely erase this picture. Um, you might think that because there's only four directions that are, that are norm zero, that this might look fairly rigid. This might look like it's hard to move things around. Right? Because um, where can this vector go? It has to go to one of these four directions. Right? It looks like I don't have a whole lot of choice. But you have more choice than you think because um, this vector actually can go to that vector. That even though it's the same direction, even though this is a scalar multiple, they're both norm zero. And so I can't move this vector to that vector. OK? Um, but I have to do it in such a way that this red curve goes to this red curve. And so what happens is that if I send this vector to twice, then I have to send this vector to half. Because it turns out that um, with a change of basis, if I actually make these my axes, if I, if I take my two or some other constant, but it's x times y equals a constant when you, when you rotate the picture. Okay? So in particular, if I think of this as my basis, so not using that anymore, if I think of this as my basis, then I can find a basis like this so that this looks like a nice little unit square. And so then when I, and basically um, this curve is the product of this times that. And so if I make, if I send this one to something longer, then I send this one to something shorter, preserving the area. And so there are motions on here where you basically um, expand in these directions and contract in these directions. And as long as my expansion constant and my contraction constant match, the red curves will go to the red curves and they'll actually slide along the red curves. The blue curves will slide along the blue curves and everything works. And if you want to see an example of that, go ahead and take this picture, write down the reflection. Well, if you go back to the A1 tilde example, no, that's not. Never mind. I can give you an example where you could do that, but you haven't seen it yet. Um, okay. So the main point that I want to make here is that this is actually more flexible than you think. Okay. That you actually can, um, even with keeping the two orange lines sent to the two orange lines, you can still move things around. Okay. Similarly, over here, um, the the red the top half of the, of the red, this is actually a model for the hyperbolic plane. And if you've seen hyperbolic geometry before, you know hyperbolic geometry has lots and lots of symmetries. And I was hoping to do a little bit with hyperbolic geometry today. Um, and I may do a little bit still. But um, this is actually, um, there are a lot of things that you can do even keeping the orange cone sent to the orange cone. Um, there's actually quite a few symmetries of this. Um, and let me just sort of um, indicate to you with um, one or two small facts how, how flexible the symmetries are. Um, suppose um, in this picture for a second, you go ahead and you pick three points on the orange circle. Suppose I pick three points, A, B, and C. And then you pick three points, um, D, E, and F, wherever you want. There's actually a symmetry of this picture that sends A to D, B to, C, B to E, C to F. Or back in this picture, I pick three directions, three orange directions coming out of the origin. You pick three orange directions coming out of the origin, all going up. I can find appropriate, I can send my three to your three. I might have to send mine, not exactly to yours, but to a scalar multiple of yours. 
but I can find multiples of your three vectors so that the images of mine going to the scalar multiples of yours ends up sending the red hyperboloid to itself. And so there's a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of flexibility. Um, and so, yeah, any three orange points can go to any three orange points with appropriate scaling, keeping the, the red part the same and keeping the blue part the same. Um, and I think the place that I'll end is, let me go ahead and switch now finally back to a Coxeter group example. In the Coxeter group example, is going to be the Coxeter group corresponding to the 2, 3, infinity diagram. And so this is something that's got you know, a, b, and c, and a squared equals b squared equals c squared equals 1. A B squared equals 1, A C cubed equals 1, and then no relation for the infinity. So I guess this is A, this is B, and this is C. And we were looking at this before. Um, we had this example up before, and we said that for those of you that know hyperbolic geometry, in hyperbolic geometry you can actually find a triangle that has a pi over 3, pi over 2, and 0 angle. That um, there's, there's one model of, of hyperbolic geometry that's easy to describe. Um, and it's called the Poincaré disk. So the points in hyperbolic geometry are just the points in the disk. The lines are of two types. They're dia diameters of the circle and there are arcs of circles that intersect at right angles. These also intersect at right angles. Okay, So point means point in the disk. Line means one of these kind of things. Okay, um, And then what is um, not immediately clear is that there's actually lots of, of there's lots and lots of, of functions that send the points to the points and send lines to lines that you can do on this. Um, and we'll come back and talk about them. If you've uh, taken complex analysis, you've seen sort of conformal transformations. And there's conformal transformations that send the disk to itself. All conformal transformations sending the disk to itself will be symmetries of hyperbolic space. Um, in addition to that, there's a metric that you can place on this. Not the usual metric, not counting this as its Euclidean distance. But there's a way of, of putting an infinitesimal metric on this so that when you try to say how far is here from here, well, you find the unique line that goes between them and you integrate the, air, the, the length element from here to there and you actually calculate the distance. And when you put that hyperbolic metric on this picture, um, all of the conformal transformations of the disk to itself actually preserve the hyperbolic metric. And so what you get is something that's like Euclidean space in that it's, it's got a metric and it's a highly symmetric metric that you can move any point to any other point. You can actually move any pair of points with a particular distance to any other pair of points with a particular distance. Um, it has a very nice uniform uh, uh, geometry. This is one model. Um, and then in this geometry, um, the nice thing about this geometry is that when you, um, so there's a way of defining length that I haven't really described. Um, but the nice thing about this model is that there's a notion of angle in hyperbolic geometry where it really is exactly the angles that you see. And so if I draw like these two, if I pick a point at the center and I draw these two diameters and then I draw something like this so that it's coming over and meeting at a right angle, whatever angle I see between these two tangent lines, that's what I want to call that angle. And by connecting this point to a point, I can move, if I, 
I can start moving this over um, so that this angle is exactly pi over 3. And then now I have a triangle that's pi over 2, pi over 3, 0. And now I can start reflecting in the sides. And it'll end up tiling hyperbolic space with these triangles. And this will be a representation of the Coxeter group. The thing that I want to mention is that this is actually related to this picture. It's actually related to this picture because there's various models of hyperbolic space. In addition to this one in the plane, which is probably, if you've seen hyperbolic geometry, this is probably the model that you've seen. There's other models of hyperbolic space where instead of taking a disk in the plane and having the lines be diameters and things orthogonal, there's a hemisphere model where you take the points on the upper hemisphere and then the lines are what you get when you slice it with a vertical plane. Okay? And so you take the upper hemisphere in R3. If you slice right through the center, what you'd get is something that looks like the diameter of a circle. If you slice over here, it's something that's going to look like this. And if you actually stared closely at the boundary, you'd see that it's intersecting at a right angle. Right? And um, um, there's a third model of hyperbolic space, which is called the Klein model, where um, it doesn't preserve... Uh, I'm running out of time. Yeah. There's five models of hyperbolic space, and I haven't written down. Um, there's a disk model, there's the upper half space model, there's a hemisphere model, there's the Klein model, and this is also a model of hyperbolic space. And um, basically, you take the Poincaré model, you change it to a hemisphere model, and then you, you view it directly from the top. And so now, points are points in the disk, but now straight lines, because we're looking straight down, straight lines actually are straight lines, but angles are distorted. And so now you take the Klein model and you set it right here. So now you've got points are points, lines are straight lines. And now you say, well, let's go ahead and take, for point, let's go ahead and look at the entire ray through the origin. And then select out the scalar multiple so that it's norm 1. For lines, let's take a line through this little disk, turn it into a plane through the origin, and then select out the portion of norm 1. Minus 1, actually. And so that'll take the points and lines in the Klein model and turn it into the things that are points and lines on the hyperboloid. And all of the symmetries of the Poincaré model become symmetries of the hemisphere model, become symmetries of the Klein model, become symmetries of the hyperboloid model. And in the hyperboloid model, they're nice linear transformations preserving the quadratic form. And so the pi over 2, pi over 3, 0 triangle there ends up looking like some little triangle of, of three planes intersecting this hyperboloid at a pi over 2 angle, a pi over 3 angle, and then intersecting at something that looks like a light point. All right. So um, when we had this Coxeter group before, we said hyperbolic geometry allows us to build something like we had before. What I'm now trying to connect up to is that if instead of just coming up with this triangle on hyperbolic space manually, if we go through our long and complicated procedure of taking our diagram, coming up with a Coxeter matrix, looking at a symmetric bilinear form, looking at the faithful linear representation like this, It'll have two positives and one negative. It'll be preserving these hyperboloids, the hyperboloid of one sheet, the hyperboloid of two sheets. And when we look at our three basic reflections, the vectors will be down here. They'll be blue. The hyperplanes will be slicing through the red. And they'll be chopping off something that looks like a pi over 2, pi over 3, 0 triangle. And the reflections will end up tiling this red cone. OK? And so we had the geometric picture before just because we knew hyperbolic geometry, but actually the linear representation picture actually gave us all of that. That if you follow it all through, you get a hyperboloid model of hyperbolic space and you get the tiling of hyperbolic space 
in this picture with nice linear transformations and it all works. Okay? And for other coxeter groups, we go beyond this picture where we can't visualize it, but the algebra still works and we can still carry through everything. All right, that's enough for the day. I'm over time. I'll see you guys.